You'll want to watch this one. There has seldom been a more important synopsis of the trans surgery debate as when Jordan Peterson spoke to Kyle Kalinske while he poked many holes in his arguments on the issue. But perhaps there's something more here that you should see because I think Jordan Peterson finally shed the curtain to reveal his real stance behind the Elliot Page tweet that got him banned from the platform. Just take a look at this. I'm somebody, nobody can argue against my lefty credentials. Everybody knows um, I'm a man of the left. But I do have a question about that specific tweet that did get you in trouble because, you know, you said something to the effect of. Um, well, I don't know if it got me in trouble. You know, I don't think I'm in trouble. Twitter banned me, but I don't consider well, that trouble. That's <laughs> fair enough. Fair point. Um, but you said something to the effect of remember when pride was a sin and. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, the criminal physician. And Ellen Page just had her breasts cut off by a criminal physician. Criminal physician, exactly. So my question is, is the physician really criminal? If you agree that adults can decide to transition, then why would the physician be criminal? Don't adults have that right if they want to transition? Not everything legal isn't criminal. And do they have that right? See, I would have left Ellen Page alone if she hadn't been parading her new abs in a fashion magazine. How many kids do you think she can convince to convert? A one? Yeah. Thousand? No, not. See, yeah. I, no, no. Really? I want to I want to respond to that. I yeah. think that with the trans community, it's very similar to the gay community, where back when that first became a big issue, people thought, oh, if we talk about it, if it's in magazines or whatever, we're promoting kids to go down that path. But really what happened is people are who they are. And that, that if they're gay, they just decided to be no. like, yeah, I'm gay. And they were just more open and honest with themselves. So I don't think you're promoting people to do that. No, that's you're just not saying, what happened. If you you're are that, it's OK. Wrong. OK, well, I'm, I'm, wait, I'm listening. There's I'm nothing listening. about that that's right. So I explain. Well, there's been an absolute look. One of the reasons that I opposed Bill C-16 in Canada to begin with, this pronoun compelled speech bill was because I knew perfectly well what was going to happen when we introduced confusion about gender identity into the public sphere. Now, the argument was that if we left people with gender dysphoria alone to make their own way and stop torturing them, that we would decrease the mental health load on those individuals. And my analysis as a clinician was that for every one person of that sort that we hypothetically saved, we doom a thousand more as a consequence of confusion and social contagion. I knew the literature on psychogenic epidemics. They used to call that mass hysteria. And it's a literature that goes back about 300 years. And whenever you introduce, often when you introduce social confusion, you can produce a psychogenic epidemic, especially among generally it's adolescent females who are most susceptible to it. So I thought, oh, well, what's going to happen is we'll produce a psychogenic epidemic of gender dysphoria among adolescent females. And that is exactly what's happened. And doesn't that tell you something? In the short span of a few years, we've seen trans identifying youth in countries like the UK and US increase exponentially in a way that cannot simply be attributed to a biological bottleneck. For example, according to the Williams Institute, which is a leading public policy research body on the issue in the US, the total percentage of trans identifying youth between the age of 13 and 17 was 0.7%, or 150,000 children in 2017. And then just five years later, the same institute's research showed a massive doubling of that number to over 300,000, or 1.4% of children between the ages of 13 and 17. Can anyone really attribute that rapid rise to the most impressionable age group as simply a consequence of biology manifesting and not a social contagion that seems to have taken over? Or at least, doesn't that proposition deserve greater airtime considering we're talking about the most vulnerable segment of the population? And it isn't the fact that we've freed up people who are, what, in doubt about their identity to be who they are. That may have happened in a tiny minority of cases. It's absolutely and definitely the case that we've doomed thousands of kids to brutal, mutilating surgery and premature sterility. And we've done that on the altar of our hypothetical moral virtue and compassion. Look, I read a corporate analysis of the trans surgery industry last week. Growth rate projection for you lefty types and your anti-corporatism. Growth rate projection. 15% per year, invest now, 
a $350 million business as of 2022, projected to expand to $750 million by 2027. No moral hazard there. There's plenty of moral hazard what, there. What and percentage? that surgery is absolutely brutal. Well, we know already that about one in five adolescents now identifies, to use that hated word, identifies as part of the hypothetical LGBTQ plus community. So it's one in five. I don't know what the upper limit is. There's a consulting group in the UK now that's claiming there's 150 different genders. There's actually, I suppose, seven billion different genders if you want to get technical about it, because everybody's temperament differs. Well, and if you think that your compassion is demanding that you extend your uh, pity to the LGBTQ plus community at the cost of sterilizing children, you should think again. You're on the wrong side of this and not Wait, in a trivial way. Don't I, I, I would appreciate if you don't ascribe beliefs to me that I don't have. Remember, my original question was, well, about, you said earlier in well, this I said, question, that, I said, that you Elliot were, Page is an adult. And so do you think that he has the right to yeah, transition? But the, that was the original. You made question. some comments after that. Yeah. But as a star mm -hmm. and a public figure and a model for emulation, mm -hmm. she also has the responsibility not to entice confused adolescents into a catastrophic decision before they have the maturity to make that decision. And there's two things that are really at the heart of this debate. One is the coercion of language that we're seeing, and the other is the issue of children and consent around the issue of permanent surgical changes. And by the way, Jordan Peterson actually underestimated the transgender surgery industry there because far from being in the hundreds of millions, it stood at $2.9 billion in 2020 and is expected to grow to nearly $6.3 billion in 2030. That's the true scale of what we're talking about here. Anyone that wants to quickly shut down the discussion around that as simply being moral panic seldom understands what it is that truly they are advocating for. And it's really incredible for two other reasons it has historically been the left that has been highly skeptical of the big pharma as well as the corporate money behind them. They're the ones that purport to stand for bodily integrity, and yet all that caution gets thrown to the wind once blinded by an ill-guided moral virtue like transitioning children with permanent life-altering surgery. It's actually something to remember as a society because every discussion that you're stopped from having is exactly the one you should have. That's the only way to root out bad ideas from the culture before they do great damage. I just have to say, Jordan, I think it's a little bit of a moral panic. I just don't see some sort of, you know, frenzy. OK, of what would you consider to become trans? What? First of all, that's a hell of a way to put it. What? Is, Why don't you that? take a look at the increase in, in surgical interventions and see what you think? I mean, how many do you think well, is too many? How Again, many, wait, look, the, if we're talking about I'll, I'll answer your question, I'll answer your question. The argument is it it used to be very repressed because that's very outside of the tradition and the norm and the standard. And that now we sort of let the be, boot off the neck a little bit. Suppressed? What used to be suppressed? All exactly. as the entire LGBTQ community. I mean, it was very recently we okay, even got gay all, marriage in the United States. First of all, they're not a community. Well, you understand what is the point this I'm community? making. No, I'm no, actually, neither. I understand it, nor you. And that's why we're delving into it. <laughs> First of all, they're not a community. That's just a catchphrase. It's a buzzword. And I'll tell you something else, that almost all the kids who are undergoing surgical intervention, the clinical literature is absolutely clear on this. 80% of kids with gender dysphoria identify as homosexual when they mature. 80%. And that means the vast majority of people who are being converted surgically are gay. Now, how is that an advantage to the gay community precisely? No, I see. I'm not I'm not taking a position in any way, shape or form on the kids, because I don't know the well, first you thing about this to comment on the kids. Well, but see, that's why we're having this conversation, though, is because my original question was about kids. the adults and what your take is on the adults. Hmm. And it sounds to me like. Let me ask you this. Would you ban transition surgery for adults? I don't know. Really? Yeah, see, really. See, We're paying a me, big price for it. And I well, think that I think that it was um, it was an 
an act of stunning hubris to conduct the first trans surgery procedure. But and it's not obvious to me at all that it's been a net social good. I think the question of adults is and should be kept completely separate from the debate around children. It's an axiom of the libertarian creed that adults can do as they wish if they aren't harming someone else, even if you vehemently disagree with what they're doing. That's why particularizing the question to the issue of children is so important. If any damage is being done, that age is where it starts on both a physiological and psychological level. And it happens because the doctors practically make the life-changing decisions for the child by interpreting the changing whims of a minor according to the ideology of their choice. Maybe that's something that has been understood for a long time, which is why one of the most fundamental texts in the ethics of medicine is the Hippocratic Oath, written nearly two and a half thousand years ago. It asks every medical professional in all of human history to, quote, first, do no harm. That's a phrase that should be starting point of every discussion around the gender transition debate. Doctors are supposed to do what's best for the patient, not become an avatar of their ideology to experiment on the patient. And perhaps there's also some substance to Jordan's opposition to calling the LGBT a community, since the word assumes a unified and homogenous identity and erases the unique individuality of people in a group. In fact, it's arguable that the L, G, and B in that acronym have very little to do with the T and Q since the former refers to sexual orientation on the basis of a fixed sexual identity while the latter deals with a socialized and self-decided gender identity, which is very different. It's an acronym that's very consistent with our modern society where people box themselves into labeled groups on both ends of the political spectrum. I think the first step to being able to stop that from happening is to have the domain of language open and not stifled by political correctness around the gender debate. And you know what? You don't even need to be right or wrong for that idea to be valid. For example, in this conversation, you'll hear Kyle and Jordan use different pronouns for Elliot Page. That's because surrendering language would automatically undermine Jordan's point in the first place. That's a right protected by his freedom of speech, and that's the only way that at least some semblance of a two-way debate can exist around this contentious subject. This, this entire argument, in many ways, is stated so idiotically that it almost defies description. I mean, what do you mean, feel like you're in the wrong body? Well, what kind of measurement is that? Now, hang on a sec. I was going to there are <laughs> rules for these sorts of diagnostic decisions. Mm -hmm. OK, the rule is that you have to make a valid and reliable diagnosis. That's if you're diagnosing depression or anxiety or obsessive compulsive disorder or cancer or anything like that. There are standards that you have to abide by mm. in order to make a diagnosis, in order to fulfill the obligations of your professional college. If someone comes to you and says, I feel like I have lung cancer. That is not sufficient grounds upon which to formulate a diagnosis, much less proceed to surgery. Mm -hmm. And so the question is, what do you mean by feel? What is that? Is that an emotion? Is it a motivation? Well, is it a philosophical so conclusion? What is so it? Somebody who is trans reached out to me and explained to me in a very straightforward way. Yeah, look, I was born biologically female. I feel like I'm biologically male. And they told me as soon as I got the surgery, changed the way I dressed, changed the way I appeared. I felt phenomenally better. And so that's why, at least for me, this was the answer. Now, I think it would be incredibly arrogant for me to say back to that person, no, you shouldn't do that, or I know better than you do for yourself. So, you know, me mm -hmm. as a simple outsider, I just look at it and say, hey, whatever floats your boat, and if it works, it works. Look, most of the time, my attitude is you can go to hell in handbasket any way you choose if you're an adult. Mm -hmm. Now, the problem, this problem is complicated and compounded by the fact of the necessity of medical involvement and the ethics on the medical front. So when you asked me about how that should be regulated, my answer was, I'm not exactly sure about that. It's obvious to me that the trans surgery enterprise has gone way too far, way too far, thousands of people too far. And I'm certain that it's harmed exponentially more people than it's helped. You see, the thing about what Jordan just said there is that they aren't foregone conclusions, but the most important starting point for further debate on the topic. And yet too often we encounter people that try to shut down the discussion in the first place, which is what we see every time Jordan Peterson finds himself canceled, suspended from social media or protested in real life. The best way that even transgender individuals can try and get the larger population to understand 
and sympathize with them is to allow even the tough discussion to happen around the issue, and I think the conversation you just saw is an example of that in America, trying to grapple with novel ideas on the political and social front.